Welcome to the After On Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Reed. And this is a series of conversations with thinkers, founders, and scientists. Take a little time and stretch out, because these talks are unhurried and meant to bring you to a top percentile understanding of something important. So, whether you're into startups or ideas, a techie or a lit major, take your time, engage your mind, and you'll be glad you did it. Especially this week, when we'll be talking to... Rick Doblin, who's been working since the 80s to bring the world a new approach to psychiatric therapy. After decades of relentlessly amassing evidence and patiently winning over medical regulators worldwide, he seems to be on the cusp of success. This is going to be my second two-part episode because it's a longer conversation, but I didn't want to pare it back for two reasons. First, every minute of it is fascinating, and it can't be told briefly because it's a long tale stretching clear back to 1912 with a significant plot twist and plot thickening in the turbulent wake of the psychedelic 60s. That's when Rick's own story kicks in, and he has lived a truly unique and uniquely American life. He shared his personal story quite generously with me, and I didn't want to give you an abridged version of it. The other factor is our interview focuses on a profoundly damaging health condition, specifically post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. And I'd hate to inadvertently edit out a detail that might turn out to be relevant to any listener— The odds of that may be low, but this is a mental condition grounded in personal biography rather than a physical disease grounded in metabolism, so it really is impossible to know what passing observation or small fact might resonate significantly with any given sufferer. So you're going to get the whole shebang split into two episodes this week and next. Anyway, back to Rick. Although his Harvard PhD is in public policy and government, Rick has been studying and or working in the medical field since shortly after his 18th birthday, if we define medicine a little loosely during those early years, when, to quote Rick, he self-identified as a countercultural, drug-using, draft-dodging criminal. But it was then that he also made a lifelong commitment to a powerful, if unorthodox, approach to therapy. Over the subsequent years, this approach started gaining mainstream acceptance at a slow but ever-compounding rate. Today, the organization Rick founded before many of you were born employs just under 60 people. Many of them are research scientists, and the relationship with the U.S. Federal Drug Administration and other global regulators verges on being a partnership, which is a bit of an exaggeration, but you'll hear my rationale for saying that in this interview, and you can be the judge. What's objectively true is that the Molecule Rick's group has submitted for approval has the rare and coveted status of breakthrough therapy designation from the FDA, which is as much of a big deal as it sounds. That compound is methylene dioxymethamphetamine. It often goes by the snappier nickname of MDMA, but it's known to its biggest fans as Molly, or ecstasy. You've probably heard of it. And thanks to Rick, it may soon become legal, or more accurately, partly legal, in your very own nation. Before we start the interview, I have another quick installment of my unusual sponsorship from the venture capital firm Obvious Ventures which bears no resemblance to traditional advertising, but instead takes the form of interviews that I conduct with smart people about emerging science, technology, and markets, which is hopefully what you tune into this show to get. Today, I'm interviewing the founder of a company Obvious Ventures invested in. His name is Steve Glenn, and the company is Plant Prefab. They don't make fully prefabricated homes, but building modules, ones uniquely tuned to urban needs. As you'll now hear, cities offer highly sustainable living, but are bedevilingly expensive places to build, which makes it hard to replace old housing stock with greener and more efficient buildings. Steve is out to fix that. We'll now hear the first two minutes of that interview, then we'll hang out with Rick Doblin. And here we go. So Steve, as an entrepreneur focused on sustainability, why did you target urban housing as a market? Buildings as a category use more energy and emit more carbon than transportation and all factory production. And cities are actually the most sustainable places to live. There was a Berkeley study that found that your carbon footprint in a city is about half of what it is in the suburbs. So I should feel good about being a New Yorker. By some measures, New York City is considered the most environmentally appropriate city in the world because it's very dense living in smaller places that are more energy efficient, meets pervasive and pretty efficient mass transit. And that's the other part. How much energy do you have to expend getting people to jobs, to services? Why is urban building inherently expensive? When you're building in cities, they're custom projects. 
Why? Because cities have different types of lot sizes, zoning that can vary neighborhood by neighborhood, height limits and setbacks, view and access issues that constrain what you can do. So whether you're doing a 40-story apartment building downtown or you're doing a teardown of a house, you are hiring an architect to do a specific solution for your lot. As opposed to when you're building in the suburbs, you have much more space, so much less constraint on what you do. It's easier, therefore, and more common to have more standardized solutions. It's harder to do custom design, custom construction. It's easier to do the same thing again and again. We're focused on that harder problem because if we're going to make urban living more accessible, we have to create a more efficient way to build these projects. Rick, your home is so unbelievably cozy. This oh, is one of the oh. cozier New England homes I've ever set foot in, which is oh. saying quite a bit. And it's so funny to think that in a sense... I'm in the command module of the global <laughs> war on post-traumatic stress disorder, yeah. which you are battling on behalf of tens, if not hundreds of millions of people worldwide. Just to start, a quick clinical definition of PTSD. I'm sure all listeners have a strong approximate sense of what it is, but if we could get everybody on a more precise and shared definition before we really dive in, that would probably be great. So what is PTSD? From a drug development perspective, PTSD is what is measured by the CAPS. So the CAPS stands for Clinician Administered PTSD Scale, and it's the gold standard for evaluating PTSD severity symptoms. So from the FDA's point of view, from our point of view, PTSD is whatever is measured by that scale. One of the main hallmarks of PTSD is intrusive memories. So people have past traumas that come to them in their dreams or when they're triggered by seeing something that reminds them of the trauma or hearing something, hearing sounds. We all know the story about somebody hearing a car back up and they think it's a bomb and they duck under the table or something. So this idea of intrusive memories, hypervigilance, hyperreactivity. So people are constantly scanning the environment for threats and they misinterpret a lot of things that other people might not see as a threat. They internalize that as a threat. And on the other side of that, there's emotional numbing. One defense against the trauma is just to go flat in terms of all your emotions. And when you try to do that to your fearful emotions, it bleeds over into all your pleasant emotions as well. And then there's a series of disabilities that come along with it about people who are unable to leave their house in the most extreme cases, or people who can only sit in certain chairs at a restaurant so that they can see who's coming in and that they know where their escape is. All of these combine to make people unable to function normally in their daily life. Also, often PTSD is linked to depression as well. You can have depression without PTSD, but it's very rare for people to have PTSD without depression. Oh, interesting. So PTSD is often comorbid with other disorders, and one of the most common ones is substance abuse disorders. Obviously, we associate it with wartime experiences, but it's also very common with people who are crime victims, sexual assault, I'd imagine some natural disasters... It's kind of a peculiarly American phenomena where we identify PTSD with war mm. as the first thing that comes to mind. I think that's in part because America has been involved in such major wars, also because we have such great respect in our culture for the military, but way more people have PTSD from non-military causes than from military causes. Yeah, it's something like eight to 10 times as many people in the U.S., our non-military PTSD suffers. In our phase two studies, we tried to figure out whether our treatment works only with certain kinds of PTSD or works with anybody that has PTSD regardless of the cause. And so our first study was actually women survivors of childhood sexual abuse, and then a few women that had adult rape and assault, and it worked great for that. The SSRIs, Zoloft and Paxil, that are the only drugs approved by the FDA for PTSD, they worked better in women than in men, and they failed in combat-related PTSD. So then we had to do a study in combat-related PTSD, and we said that this study is for veterans, firefighters, and police officers. We didn't actually think we would get any firefighters or police officers, but actually we did. So we had 22 veterans, three firefighters, and one police officer. Getting back to the experience, the human toll 
I came up with some jarring statistics as I was getting ready for this interview. These aren't going to be news to you, but I very quickly found out that PTSD increases the risk of early death by almost a third. Suicide attempts are carried out by 29% of PTSD sufferers, which is many, many times higher than what you see in the general population. Veterans with PTSD are 50% more likely to be unemployed, and PTSD sufferers are three times more likely to have multiple marriages that end in divorce. So those are numbers that start painting this horrible toll. I think to make it more vivid, I was hoping you might be able to talk us through the personal toll of somebody that you personally worked with. There are so many different kinds of stories, but I'll share one with a fellow named John Lubecki, who is comfortable with me mentioning his name. He's done a fair number of interviews under his real name, and he was one of the veterans in our study. Where was he deployed? He was in Iraq. And what happened was that he was blown up in the base from a mortar. You normally think of war as like you're in your base and you're safe, and then you go out to wage war. But in Iraq, Afghanistan, it wasn't like that. After he came back, he became an alcoholic and was often unable to leave the house. It had serious consequences for his relationship with his wife. And it was so difficult for him that he attempted suicide five different times. He slit his wrists. One time, he actually put a gun to his head and pulled the trigger, and the gun malfired. And it was only after that that he went to seek treatment. I know this story a little bit. Didn't he say that that was a moment of incredible peace, that microsecond? Yeah, he thought it would be over. Yeah, that just gives you a sense of how deep it got. That's terrible. Yeah, and he went to seek treatment from the Veterans Administration, and they offer drugs and they offer psychotherapy. And they do work for some people, but there's a large number of people for whom they don't work. And John was one of the people for whom they did not work. As of several months ago, the Veterans Administration had a million thirty seven thousand veterans receiving disability payments for PTSD. Receiving active disability month to month. Over a million. Yeah. Not all of them are a hundred percent disabled with PTSD. They're disabled with different percentages. Yeah. But the amount of money that the VA spends, they do not share. Precisely. I'm sure that they know what it is, but as of 2005, in congressional testimony, it was 20000 average annual cost for people on disability. For PTSD. For PTSD. So yeah. assuming that that's the same, that's $20 billion a year. Yeah. And I would say that's the tip of the iceberg because that doesn't include treatment costs, right? That's just the disability payments, correct? Yes. Disability payments are surely a tiny fraction of the foregone earnings. Yes. Then the biggest thing is we can't put a price on that suffering. Also, just think of the cost of training those people, too. Right. You lose all that. And then the, the other thing is that most of these are young people. They got 40 more years or 50 more years of disability payments. So it's incredible. And there's roughly 8 to 10 million people in America with PTSD. So even this tip of the iceberg that we're talking about, of which $20 billion is just the beginning of the cost, multiply that times 8 to 10 for one nation, the global burden, I wouldn't be surprised if there were hundreds of millions of sufferers out there. Well, I believe that's true. And a lot of times people just take the base rate of violence in their society as a given, and they don't identify as having PTSD, but they're very traumatized. Yeah. One of the things that really helped us a lot with the military was the work that Dr. Richard Rockefeller and his cousin, Senator Jay Rockefeller, did to help us build some relationships with the Veterans Administration and the Department of Defense. But really what got Richard so initially focused on that is that he was chairman of the Board of Advisors of Doctors Without Borders, and he saw the consequences of the war in Kosovo and Serbia with so many refugees. And they're all traumatized, and there's no therapists and psychiatrists to treat them. Yeah, and I think about Rwanda, the entire nation who's old enough to remember the genocide has to have PTSD and Democratic Congo and some of these places. Well, talk about numbers. One of our donors is trying to help us bring MDMA therapy to China. And what he said was that when we had the psychedelic revolution, they had the cultural revolution and his parents and everybody from their generation has got deep trauma. Yeah, because that was a very violent period in China. It went on for years and years. 20 or 30 million people starved to death. So the amount of trauma in the world is just enormous. And then the other aspect that we're learning more and more about, we're working with this woman, Rachel Yehuda, who is one of the world's experts on PTSD. She's at the Bronx VA, but she's helped pioneer the work of epigenetics and PTSD and how multi-generational trauma is passed down. So somebody who is traumatized and lives their life with some form of PTSD 
has children and certain genetic switches are pre-activated in those kids. And so that PTSD ends up influencing later generations. Yeah. So we think of it as a problem that we have now, but it's a problem that passes from generation to generation as well. You mentioned Zoloft and Paxil. If we're talking about pharmaceuticals, these are the only designated alternatives right now. How effective are they? They are effective to some extent and maybe 40 or 50% of the people in reducing symptoms. Reducing symptoms, not curing. Not curing. So you have to take the drugs every day for months, years, or decades. Does it cure the problem? But they have terrible side effects. But in America and elsewhere in the world, too, doctors can prescribe drugs off-label, meaning they are approved for something, but then they could be prescribed for something else. So it tends to be that people who have had chronic PTSD have been through a whole series of drugs, even drugs that are not specifically approved for PTSD, and very much over-medicated. Here's drugs then to control the side effects of other drugs, and they have side effects, and then psychotherapy is offered But the problem is that there's large numbers of dropouts, that talk therapy requires people to talk about their trauma. And for some people, that's re-traumatizing, that's triggering. So not everybody can engage in therapy. And those are the ones that then tend to go into substance abuse and whatever they can to run away from their problems. Yeah. In phase two in particular, you were working with sufferers who are characterized as chronic, severe, and treatment resistant. So let's talk just briefly what chronic severe treatment resistant means. Well, chronic means six months or more. So what we find is that most people who are traumatized do not develop PTSD. Most people have enough resilience that they'll be able to recover. How large of a majority of people? Roughly 90% of people that are traumatized don't develop PTSD. Now, it's different if it's like childhood sexual abuse that's a long duration. So when it's called complex PTSD, when you continue to be re-traumatized, more people like that will develop PTSD. Chronic is six months or more. And the reason that we chose that is because there's a generally accepted understanding that once people have had PTSD for six months, they're not going to get better on their own. Then treatment-resistant, people had to have failed on medication or failed on psychotherapy. Sometimes people refuse medication. So from the FDA's point of view, treatment resistant is now defined as failure on two different medications. So they don't regulate psychotherapy. They don't care about psychotherapy. And so you have to try two different medications. But the thing that really struck me when I was reading about your phase two, the average person in the phase two had suffered from PTSD for an average of 17.8 years. That just shows how unbelievably stubborn these cases are. So let's talk about the results. You had 107 people across a handful of different trials in different locations, right? Yeah. So we had studies in Israel, Canada, Switzerland, and the U.S. So the treatment initially began with two MDMA sessions, one month apart, and then nine 90-minute non-drug psychotherapy sessions, three before the first session for preparation, and then three after each MDMA session for integration. And we waited two months after the last MDMA session to do what's called the primary outcome measure. And then we do another measure 12 months later to show if it's durable or not. While we were doing the studies, we started realizing that there were some people that needed more therapy. So we added a third session. A third session of MDMA. third session of MDMA, and then three more non-drug psychotherapy sessions. So the architecture became 12 therapy sessions 90 minutes each, correct? Yeah. So these are not short. Right. And there's a team that administers a male-female team. Our operating philosophy was, how do we maximize therapeutic outcomes? What's going to really get the best results? And then we would figure out economics of it later. And those people that do get PTSD who are traumatized tend to have had a series of traumas in their lives, often going back to childhood. And that's where having a well-functioning male-female team, in some ways it replaces what they didn't get when they were being parented. Oh, almost a parental structure. Interesting. Yes, yes. That's part of the idea. The other part of the idea, sadly, is that there have been occasional rare instances of sexual abuse of patients when they're under the influence of drugs. Oh, wow. Just as historically. Just historically, yes. Yeah. So to prevent that, if you've got two therapists, they both have to be corrupt, which is not likely. Not likely. Then the other part is that a lot of women who have been sexually abused by a man might not feel as comfortable if it's just a male therapist. So having a male-female team that works well together seems to us to be 
an excellent approach to really get the most benefits. So it's a very impressively labor-intensive process. Yeah. With dual therapists, 90 minutes, 12 sessions, always three sessions in between each MDMA yeah. session. Now let's talk about what's happening in the MDMA session. We have worked with FDA, worked with the National Institute of Mental Health, actually, and developed a manual to standardize the psychotherapy. And so we call it interdirected therapy. And the manual is on the MAPS website. So if people wanted to read what our therapeutic approach is in detail, you just go to MAPS, M-A-P-S dot org, and a menu bar that says research, and then you go down to MDMA, and at the bottom of that page is what's called the treatment manual. And I will tell people, your website is incredibly extensive and dense with resources. I mean, if somebody's interested in this topic, they can easily spend hours and hours educating themselves there. And in addition to the treatment manual, we have trained a group of people to look at videotapes of the therapy sessions. We call them our adherence raters. And so then they will give feedback to the therapists about how they could be more adhering to our method. Wow. And then also the therapists go through significant training. 14 hours online is a prequel to a full week in person, full time. That's part A and part B. Then there's part C. We have successfully negotiated with FDA and basically said that we think that therapists who want to give MDMA to their patients will be more effective if they've done MDMA themselves. The only way that we could give people this training was legally inside a protocol. So the FDA then told us, we cannot give you a protocol just to train therapists, but if you turn it into some sort of scientific study, we don't care what the science is, it's up to you. Because you are basically asking the FDA for permission to give illegal drugs to non-patients at this point. And DEA as well. And what percentage of would-be therapists elect to use the MDMA? Almost everybody. Even people that have had MDMA in a recreational setting, when they take it in their therapeutic setting, they see it's much different. But when it comes time to make this into a medicine and we train people, some people might have health reasons, religious reasons, whatever, they don't want to do it. So in any case, we also ask for people to sit for one other person meaning that they are part of a co-therapy team when somebody else is getting MDMA. As an observer. As an observer. Some people will have three therapists in the room. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So that's part C. Then part D is we give them scenarios to act out, role-playing under videotape, and then they send us back the videotapes, and then we have our therapy training team and adherence raters watch these videotapes to give them more feedback. So this is role-playing things that may happen during the MDMA session. Yeah. So the very final step is we ask for people to work with one PTSD patient under supervision. So this is extraordinarily in-depth training with so much coaching. Are they psychologists or some of them therapists that are neither psychologists nor psychiatrists? Some of them are like a master's in social work where you've focused on psychotherapy. They're marriage and family counselors. Most of them are not PhDs or MDs. The goal, again, is get the best outcomes. And it's not always the case that the people that have the highest credentials credentials are the ones to give the best therapy. And it's also the case that a lot of psychiatrists get to be psychiatrists without ever going through their own therapy. And they're not really good at therapy. They're good at adjusting your medications. Backing up one more step, the existing psychotherapies for PTSD, like cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive processing therapy, prolonged exposures, those are also manualized, but they're manualized in a way that's much different than our manual, in that what they do is they prescribe certain specific kinds of interactions and certain specific orders of the process that must be followed. And session one is different than session two. Session two is different than session three. You know, different lessons, different ideas, different concepts. So very choreographed. Very, very choreographed. So we have this fundamental belief in terms of the inner healer. We all know that when you hurt your body, there's a self-healing mechanism that is not under our conscious control that tries to restore the shape of the body to the way it was before. Heels, cuts, men's bones, et cetera. Yeah. Michael Midhofer, our lead psychiatrist, before that he was an emergency room doctor. And so he said that he saw his job as to clean out the wounds, and then he created the conditions for the body to heal itself. But a lot of times there were things in the way that he had to remove or things he had to set or different things like that. The assumption is that there's a similar process for the psyche. 
that there's this self-healing mechanism of the psyche, but fear, trauma, childhood maltreatment, different things get in the way. So we don't always move towards mental health. The other part of this is when our body heals, there's kind of a sequence of things. You know, you get a scab, you get different things. But again, the order is not under our conscious control. So we have this sense that what's going on with MDMA and going on with the classic psychedelics is that there's basically a membrane between the conscious and the subconscious. And in different ways, the classic psychedelics in MDMA make this membrane more permeable to emotionally charged material. So we have this belief that there is an order to what people think of and feel when they're under the influence of MDMA that is beyond their conscious control, but is somehow or other to be respected, that there is this inner process. So in this eight-hour therapy session, we don't have a scripted order like other psychotherapies. We believe this process of emergence has a wisdom of its own. And so we support people to experience whatever's happening in their mind and also in their body. The amount that you give people, is that typical of what a recreational dose? The amount that we give is typical of a recreational dose. It's typical, okay. We feel that the MDMA brings people into what has been called the optimal arousal zone. They're not hypervigilant and they're not emotionally numb. They're alert and they're emotionally open and they can process. In the 50s and 60s, the work with LSD and psilocybin demonstrated in heroin addicts, alcoholics, cancer patients with anxiety, other patients, what they found was that the depth of the mystical experience correlates with therapeutic outcome. But not so with MDMA. Not so at all with MDMA. Because what we're talking about is traumas that happen to you, you have to be in your ego, in your biography, and looking at what happened, and you're sort of swapping out painful memories that don't seem to be stored in long-term memory, and also you're trying to swap out the emotional tone of them so you remember it even better, but you remember it as something that happened in the past that you survived, that's part of your story, but that doesn't trigger you every, every time. So being grounded in your biography and feeling a certain significant fear reduction through MDMA's effect on the amygdala to reduce your fear response to emotional challenges, you were still located directly in yourself and dealing with your trauma. So you were intensely lucid and very present. Are they wearing eye shades? Yeah, they're wearing eye shades and generally wearing headphones as well. Headphones. And is there music pumped in or is that just... There's music. Yeah, it's not just to keep them quiet and isolated, but it's to provide like a carrier wave of emotion. And there's different playlists that different therapists use. But in general, it starts more peaceful to get you into this peaceful mood to be open to anything. And then there's more energetic music for a couple hours as MDMA is at its peak and you're trying to work with difficult things. And then near the end, it'll phase, fade down into more peaceful music. Now with headphones on, does that impede their ability to communicate with the therapist? Generally, when they want to talk with the therapist, they take, take the eye shades and the headphones off. So oh, they take the eye shades off too. As well, yeah. Without any kind of order, it turns out that more or less people spend about half the time internally processing they could be shaking, they could be letting out all sorts of energy in their body, they could be kicking, they could be screaming. You're back at the trauma and you're like right there, but now you're not frozen. You're able to express yourself because your life is not a danger at that time. But roughly half the time, people end up talking to the therapist. And it, it'll vary from person to person and session to session, but there's an awful lot of time when people are healing themselves. They can process in whatever order they want to. And what we have found is it's absolutely incredible, the poetic, metaphoric nature of what people are going through. It's about storytelling. And people tell themselves stories in images and metaphors. Just as an example, one of the veterans had this image of sort of his warrior self, which was like a gorilla locked in a cage inside him. And he said that when he came back from Iraq, he was scared what this part of him could do. During an MDMA session, he had this image of this warrior self locked in a cage, and he started realizing that the fact that it was locked in a cage made it worse, not better. And then he had the image of this gorilla reaching out between the bars of the cage and stabbing him in the side. And then he was able to take the knife and pull the knife out and then let the warrior side gorilla out of the cage. And then they became friends and embraced. And then he saw that this was a part of him that had kept him alive in certain circumstances. And he narrated all this in a sense. Well, 
only later. So this is all going on while he's having this whole hour quiet, basically. And this is him, again, trying to get myself into his headspace. This is not an intensely hallucinogenic drug. So these aren't images that he's seeing. These are almost a story he's telling himself. Exactly. He's figuring himself out. He's not seeing crazy dancing images of gorillas in front of his face. Yeah. That's really interesting. So he's really forming his own narrative a new way to frame the situation. There's something about stories that are very conducive to human memory. That anchor things. Yeah. Something about these stories that we tell ourselves influences the filters through which we see the world. Also, in our method, one key element in our method, which I would distinguish from certain kinds of shamanism, in that the shaman is the healer. The shaman is the one that heals you. But We believe that we are empowering people to heal themselves, and we want them to continue to be able to heal themselves even after the therapy is over without having to come back for more therapy or more MDMA. So there's no positioning of the therapist as shaman or gurus or healers or professors. It's really on you, Mr. Warrior, to make peace with the gorilla in the cage. Yeah, exactly. You have to heal yourself. And then three 90-minute sessions leading up to this— There's all kinds of coaching and discussion of the power of narrative and the kinds of things that you might want to reflect on when you get into that space. Yeah. But the fundamental thing that's happening during those three preparation sessions is building what's called the therapeutic alliance. Between the therapist and the patient. Yeah. The therapist gets to know the person. The person knows that they're known. The person feels safe so that when they are under the influence of MDMA, they're able to explore and become vulnerable in ways that they have been protecting themselves from before because they feel safe. They take the drug. How long does it take to take effect? Between 30 and 60 minutes. Okay, so they're kind of quiet in that point and probably starting to think their thoughts about what they want to conquer in this session. And then when it starts coming on, in party sessions, it's described as being very social, very loving, very open. People like to dance and so forth. This is very different. So how do they describe the feelings of it coming on? Is it still blissful or is it a different mindset in this very different setting? Well, It varies from individual to individual. And some people will go to blissful. They feel relaxed in different ways. Sometimes people will understand that when they have these anxieties that come up when they're thinking about their trauma, they can get past what normally would have been a panic attack, that they can process it. They won't run away from those feelings. Because of the sort of blissful, relaxing nature of the chemical, they can actually face and wrestle with memories that would otherwise be toxic and terrifying and they'd lock up. So they can really access it in a way that would otherwise be very difficult. Yeah, there's a release of oxytocin, which is a hormone of love and bonding, nursing mothers. We all have it when we feel loving feelings. And so MDMA releases oxytocin. And so that builds this therapeutic alliance, helps people feel connected. So it really deepens that already positive relationship with the therapists, which makes them feel all the safer and all the more inclined to talk about it. And the fact that they can access these feelings with far less terror and they have this great bonding. I see the synergy in that. It's very powerful. Yeah, very much so. Although I would say you use the word what they want to conquer. Yeah. And so it's not so much that you conquer, but you accept. Accept. He's not getting rid of the gorilla. He's putting it into a different context and saying, actually, it turns out he's saved my life during war. Yeah, and it's a part of me that I've disowned, and now I need to bring them all together. And there is a sense in which you conquer your fear of these certain memories, and your memories come back. But many of them don't feel the bliss. A lot of people have said, I don't know why they call this ecstasy. (laughs) Because they're doing hard work on it. Yeah. So it's just what's there emerges. And some people do go to beautiful memories that they get strength from, and then they'll go into their trauma. Other people will go straight to the trauma, and then only later, or maybe never, will they get to beautiful things. Some people aren't able to tell themselves a story yet because the story is so scary, but they have all sorts of bodily sensations, trapped energy that they release, or rocking and screaming. So we don't have any order during these eight hours. That's up to the individual. And we don't use music with words in general. We don't want to plant imagery in people. And we don't use guided imagery during your first hour. Let's imagine that you're on a beautiful island. Yeah, we don't do that. Not to say that those can't be effective, but we have decided to develop a certain specific method. And I think that there's this way in which people don't often have this inner focus for eight hours, sometimes never in their life do they have that where it's really about their inner world. 
And the MDMA does bring things to awareness and it does make people feel a lot of self-acceptance. So it's not just love of others or love of the connection, but the essence is the self-love, self-acceptance, however you happen to be. We're planning to start some studies with MDMA for eating disorders. A lot of eating disorders, people, particularly women, are super critical and super perfectionist, but there's a lot of rejection of who they are. And so MDMA is excellent in self-acceptance, whatever your story happens to be. So we support what emerges. If people are quiet, usually every 45 minutes, hour or something, we'll just say, what's going on with you? But there's a lot of information that comes from nonverbal cues. How are they breathing? Are they clenching their hands or are their hands open? Are they look like they're resisting or look like they're opening to whatever is happening? And so the difference between what we would say is a difficult trip and a bad trip, we say difficult is not the same as bad. And what makes something bad is in general the resistance to it. What makes something difficult is that it's painful, it's problematic, it's yeah. difficult. But if you can look at it, if you can deal with it, if you can acknowledge it, accept it, that's the road to healing. We let them be quiet if they want to be quiet. But you also let them rock back and forth and scream if they want to do that. And sometimes we even encourage them. If yeah. we see them doing certain kind of motions, what we might say to them is, you can enlarge that, let that go. You don't have to hold yourself back. Of all the hundreds of sessions you've now had, phase two, phase one, and adjacent, have there been any scary moments? There's been scary moments for several people where they decided they did not want to continue the therapy. And usually it was because of realizations that were so problematic for them. So I'll give two examples. There was a person who applied to be in the study who had been in jail for murder. And he had just gotten out of jail. And it came out that he had been in jail for murdering his father. His father had sexually abused him as a child and as he was growing up. And at one point in time, they had an argument and his father had a gun and they wrestled for the gun. And then this fellow got the gun and accidentally shot his father. Under the influence of MDMA, though, he started realizing that maybe it wasn't entirely an accident. That thought that maybe he wasn't such an accidental murderer, but maybe there was some real intention behind that was so difficult for him that he said, I can't go any further. Interesting. And he yeah. dropped out of the study. There was another person that was in our Swiss study who had actually immigrated into Switzerland from Turkey. And his trauma was that he was supervisor of somebody in a factory and somebody that he supervised their machine malfunction and killed him right next to him. So under the influence of MDMA, he started realizing and sharing that in his part of Turkey, if you're responsible for somebody else's death, their family is obligated to come kill you. So again, he started worrying or thinking maybe there was some responsibility he had, and then that thought was too scary too for much. him. Yeah. So both of these people dropped out of the study. They weren't made worse. We tracked them up, but they weren't made better because again, when we say to people, you're going to be healing yourself, you can also choose not to heal. Yeah. The therapist removes their ego to some extent from, are you getting better or not? Because it's up to you. It's not like, I'm a great therapist. You must get better. It's that I provide a safe space, but whether you get better or not is depend on the hard, courageous work that you choose to do or you choose not to do. Or you choose not to do now, but maybe in the second session you'll do it. We are basically followers rather than leaders, although occasionally we have to say to people, stop talking and close your eyes and listen to the music. You're being too verbal, too intellectual. This is about something deeper, trying to connect your mind and your emotions. We don't order them, but we suggest. And more or less, as I said, half the time people are internal and half they're communicating with the therapist. With LSD or psilocybin, because those drugs tend to dissolve the ego and make verbal communications more difficult, it's more like 80 or 90% of the time people are listening to music, having their own internal experience, and then 10 or 20% of the time talking to the therapist. So let's get to the results that you had with this phase two. What did you learn of those 107 people? Well, the first thing that we learned was that we could create a safe context. So people did not commit suicide. People did not attempt suicide. People did not overheat and have hyperthermia, as occasionally happens in a rave setting. People did not drink too much water and dilute their blood. And people were nauseous. People had some sleepless nights. People had more anxiety after because it's like taking the scab off of something and it's difficult to process. So there was no really serious 
adverse events that were unexpected, and the ones that came were temporary. So first off, we demonstrated that we could treat people safely, which was in and of itself a great finding, that people had had this idea that MDMA is going to cause MDMA addicts. You know, we also didn't find that people kept readministering MDMA outside of the setting. Yeah, I think I read that although 29% of your patients had used MDMA recreationally before, only 8% used it after. Yeah. And those who did use it were generally trying to recreate the therapy session as opposed to truly recreational. And again, of that 8% small minority that used it, they used it an average of, I think it was 1.3 times per year. So you're not turning veterans into devotees of electronic dance music and rave culture. (laughs) If anything, your MDMA use is going down, and that's important. Well, for example, I just had a meeting this morning with two local police chiefs, and that was one of their questions, is if police officers with trauma go through this treatment, are they going to become addicted to MDMA? So first off, we learned that we could do it safely. Secondly, this was one of the very key factors, is we learned that our treatment worked regardless of the cause of PTSD. So Zoloft and Paxil, SSRIs worked more in women than in men and didn't work in combat-related PTSD. Specifically, Zoloft and Paxil, the only two prescribed medicines, don't work for combat PTSD. So we also learned that our approach works for complex PTSD. People who were re-traumatized. Yeah, tended to be childhood sexual abuse or just difficult parents or people that are in war situations. Sometimes it's not one battle, but it's a whole sequence of things. But it worked regardless of the cause of PTSD. Then the other thing that we learned is that we got medium to high effect sizes. So not only did it work, but it was significant reductions of PTSD symptoms on average. And one of the big parts of the phase two was to figure out how to do a double-blind study. And a quick pocket definition of double-blind for those who don't know. You have two groups. One group gets the treatment, the other group doesn't. But Nobody knows. So double blind is the patient doesn't know which group they're in and the researchers or therapists don't know either. Triple blind is for when the independent raters don't know either. The people who rate symptoms subsequently. Yes. And so what we learned in phase two was that my dissertation at Harvard was wrong. Your PhD thesis. (laughs) My PhD was wrong. Well, they're hopefully not going to take it away from you then. (laughs) Well, hopefully not. And your thesis had postulated what? I looked very closely at how to solve the double-blind problem. How do you do a double-blind study with drugs that are so psychoactive that you generally know if you've taken them or not? The solution that I proposed was that we give therapy plus low doses versus therapy plus full dose. So the low dose would presumably be below the therapeutic threshold, but it would also nonetheless trigger sensations that everybody's going to say, I feel weird but nobody's going to know how weird they actually feel. Exactly. And I was right in the sense that there was more confusion. The 25, 30, and 40 milligram doses, people were confusing that, and the therapists were occasionally confusing that with full dose as well. What we learned, though, is that there was an anti-therapeutic effect. At those low doses. At those low doses, that they activate people, but they don't reduce the fear enough. So the, the trauma that they've been unable to process for years or decades... Now they're in a situation where they're being asked to focus on their trauma. They have this little bit of energy from the drug. That enables them to access it, but it still sucks. Yeah, it still sucks. They still got better to some extent, but the people that had the therapy without any MDMA got even better than the people that had the therapy with low-dose MDMA. So... What we learned is that there is no solution to the double-blind problem. So when you go forward with phase three, are you still going to have a control group and a placebo group, but it's just going to be obvious to everybody, like you didn't win the lottery, you're just getting therapy, but by the way, you're getting 12 90-minute sessions, and that's not bad? Yeah. So to the punchline, the phase two results. Okay. So the phase two results demonstrated that in the people that had therapy without active MDMA... 23% of them no longer had PTSD at the two-month follow-up after the last experimental session. So the sessions went over about three months. So we're talking about five months after they began on this CAPS table. Essentially, you don't have PTSD anymore. Yeah, 23%. Yeah, you have, in a sense, at least for this moment, been cured. Yes. Which is not something that Zoloft and Pax will do. They just mitigate symptoms and you're on them for life. Yeah, in general, that's true. So the 23% is really pretty good when you realize that these are chronic, on average, severe treatment-resistant 
persistent PTSD. They've already failed on medication or psychotherapy. So the 23% is really pretty good. Yeah. And it demonstrates that we're trying our best with the therapy to try to help people. And that's why we have the videotapes and the adherence criteria to make sure that the method is the same. That even though the therapists are generally able to tell if it's MDMA, they're not half-hearted with the placebo people. They're fixing a quarter of them. That's a big deal right there. Yeah, they're doing well. When you add MDMA, the results more than double to 56% no longer having PTSD. Wow. And that's really, really good. However, the most important thing is that teaching them techniques that can translate from the MDMA state to the regular state, to the non-drug state of about working with their emotions, not suppressing their emotions. So what we discovered at the one-year follow-up was that 68%, two-thirds, no longer had PTSD. So actually it went up. Rather than backsliding, it's actually gone up to two-thirds. Yeah. It's amazing. There's a process where people are continually getting better and better. Wow. And again, I'm going to just redraw attention to this statistic that these people on average had had PTSD for 17.8 years going in. So 17 years of unrelenting suffering to suddenly be 12 months, with that's a huge deal. Well, what it demonstrates is that our brain and our psyche gets in these certain grooves yeah, and that you can still break free decades, decades later. So it's an enormously helpful message. So we've actually worked with some Vietnam vets. And in Israel, we worked with somebody who had PTSD from the Yom Kippur War. So people should take hope, you know, stuck for decades and decades and decades. And in every instant, there's still that moment of possibility of healing. 18 years is a very long time to suffer from anything. And to me, that greatly magnifies the relevance of the 56 rising to 68% cure rate. Because these are people who have been there for so long. The possibility of a quantum leap of like, oh, if you just gave them another year, they would have fixed themselves. You might say that if they'd been suffering for 18 months. But if they've been suffering for 18 years, that's a pretty solidly established pattern. So let's talk about phase three, which you're now in. Okay. Do you want me to let the dog in? Is that? Yeah, um, maybe she's getting a little chatty now. Yeah. The occasional bark was kind of ambiance, but she sounds like she wants in now. Pick that. Any rattling that anybody hears now, tip of the dog has joined (laughs) us in here. A very sweet and happy dog. So you might hear some tail wagging and rattling of tags. Yeah. Before we talk about phase three, we have data right now from 31 male, female co-therapy teams in the final stage of their training where they each worked with one PTSD patient in the same design as phase three. We're now talking about people who are training for phase three. Yeah. So everybody had to do one open label MDMA treatment session with a PTSD patient. Which doesn't count as part of phase three. This is just training. Yeah. So the results from that is that of these 31 patients, that the results were even better than the results in phase two. Wow. They're more than the 66%. Yeah. They were actually... 74% no longer qualified for a diagnosis of PTSD. Wow. And there's something called a clinically significant reduction of PTSD. You can have a symptom reduction, but you still have PTSD. So when you combine it, we had 94% response rate in that people either had a clinically significant reduction of PTSD or they no longer qualified for a diagnosis. So 74 cured and 20% had clinical reduction. Yeah. Wow. And that's in a sense your transitional phase from phase two to phase three. Yes. So I imagine you're feeling very optimistic going into phase three. What that also suggests to us is that it's from the MDMA. (laughs) You know, the fact that we have all these new co-therapy teams that are getting such terrific results makes us believe that it's in large part more than 50% due to the MDMA to help people heal themselves. And it also helps us with this understanding that there can be tens of thousands of therapists one day. Yeah, that gives you the sense that this can in fact scale, which is a big deal if you want to really cure large numbers of people. So moving into phase three, you had two really big things happen. You got the FDA agreement letter and you also got breakthrough status. These are big post-phase two accomplishments in my mind. Yes, they are, and it's on the basis of those two that we were able to raise the $28 million for phase three. So the agreement letter is an agreement letter in what's called the special protocol assessment process. When I was at the Kennedy School, I took a class at Harvard Law School from a fellow named Peter Barton Hutt, and the class was food and drug regulation, and he's the leading pharmaceutical company 
lawyer in the country. He used to be the lawyer for the FDA. He wrote the textbook that's used at law schools everywhere, and he later became on my dissertation committee. In the almost 50 years that he's been watching and being involved with the FDA, there's been two major developments that he thinks have been very significant in increasing the rate at which successful drugs can move through the FDA system. One of those is more meetings with the FDA. The FDA used to see themselves as there's all these greedy, rapacious pharmaceutical companies, and our job is to block them at every stage and make them prove and prove over again, and then we'll let this drug out. The balance has shifted a little bit more now towards their partners with the pharmaceutical industry, and so there's more meetings. So you have what's called a pre-IND meeting. Before you start your drug development, you can have a meeting to talk about what kind of issues might arise for your particular drug, how the FDA wants to handle it. You have different meetings throughout the course of your drug development process. So that's one of the innovations. The other was special protocol assessment. So what that means is that once you've been approved to go to phase three, you can elect to go through a review process that delays the whole thing by usually six to 12 months. And what you do is you engage the FDA in a series of meetings about the exact protocol that you want to use for phase three, your statistical analysis plan, and then all the other questions that the FDA have about toxicity, about abuse liability, all these different things. And you get a whole list of studies that you have to do that we want to see all this data. And here's how we agree on your phase three design. So you basically agree on the endpoints. You agree on all the endpoints. And on the designs. So you have, in a sense, in partnership with them, yes. designed your phase three. Yes. And engaging this doesn't always mean that you're going to end up with an agreement. And it doesn't mean that if you don't have an agreement, you have to stop. You can go forward even without an agreement and then get the data and then address it later once you've got your data. But when you do get an agreement letter, the FDA is legally bound to approve the drug if you get statistically significant evidence of efficacy and if no new safety problems arise. So you invest that extra year, which I imagine a lot of cases pharma companies would be loath to do because they've got financial pressures and everything else. But by investing that extra year, you essentially take the politics out of it. I mean, if you deliver your endpoints, they are legally obliged to say yes. That's a big deal. Yeah, that's enormous. And particularly for us... Where we had the whole question of the uh, double blind. So for most pharmaceutical drugs, they don't have to deal with the double blind right. problem. If you take a vaccine, how do you know what's in the pill or syringe or whatever it Your is? Your arm hurts the next day and that's all there is to it. You have yeah. no idea. So we felt that it was absolutely essential to go through this special protocol assessment process. And you got your letter of agreement. We did. And th the other thing that's different from most other drugs that the FDA is reviewing is that because MDMA is an illegal drug and has been used for decades by tens and tens of millions of people and has been studied by different governments all over the world to try to look at the risks to justify prohibition, we have an incredibly robust set of information about the actual risks of MDMA. We're not likely to be surprised. You won't be ambushed. Yeah. And so most drugs that are reviewed by FDA are approved after only a couple hundred or a couple thousand patients. But there are a lot of drugs that have like a one in 50,000 side effect or a one in 100,000 side effect. And you don't find that out until they're marketed and millions of people take it and then they pull the drug off the market. I almost feel like the New York Post has helped you because you know <laughs> if there was a one in 100,000 side effect yeah. of a drug like MDMA, it would have made it into the tabloids. Yeah. You know, like one out of 100,000 people, their left arm falls off mysteriously. That would not escape public notice. And this will be also helpful for the psilocybin people or the marijuana people because hundreds of millions have used marijuana and tens of millions have used psilocybin. Okay, so we got special protocol assessment. So breakthrough therapy is the other FDA main program for what they consider the most promising drugs. So what you have to have is a, a clinical condition for which there's large numbers of treatment-resistant people, and it looks like the new drug that you're developing for that is a significant clinical advance on what's already there. Either it's more effective or it's more safe or whatever. And it's a minority of drugs that get designated breakthrough. Well, only a fraction of the drugs that are being studied, the sponsors apply to FDA for breakthrough therapy. If you're the 10th antidepressant drug... Right. You know, or the, the sixth SSRI or something like that. So most drugs don't even apply for breakthrough therapy. And then of the sponsors that apply for breakthrough therapy, two thirds are rejected. But my concern was not that MDMA wouldn't qualify. I thought MDMA clearly is a breakthrough drug, but 
the special protocol assessment is like inside baseball. Most people don't know what it means and you get it and it's quiet, but breakthrough therapy is more public. Well, it sounds like a very big deal. Just the term itself, somebody gets that this is a big deal. So what I was concerned about is that this took place in 2017. President Trump is now the president. Attorney General Sessions. Famously anti-drug. Famously anti-drug is now there at the Department of Justice. And so I was just concerned to what extent is the FDA, which has been since 1992, really putting science over politics, to what extent are they courageous enough to follow the science in such a public way as breakthrough therapy, where every congressman or woman would know about it, it would be reported in the Washington Post and the New York Times. As it turned out, the FDA demonstrated yet again that they are willing to put science over politics, and they gave us breakthrough therapy. What does that get you? It gets you shorter review times, and you can also call more meetings with them. Oh, that's when good. When you have questions. Yeah. yeah. So it's really helpful in a lot of different ways. And it was also helpful when we went to the European Medicines Agency. We got the EMA, the European Medicines Agency, to agree to the same protocol design as the FDA. And EMA is the FDA of the EU. So that dozens and dozens of countries are under its jurisdiction. Yeah. So they agreed with the FDA that we could use inactive placebo. They agreed that they would take the data that we generate for FDA under consideration. And so we have to do one large multi-site study in Europe rather than two for the FDA. And breakthrough therapy was something that was very important to them in their understanding of where we were. And to your donors, as you mentioned. Now, what was it that you raised? You said 20... 28 million. Yeah, that's no small sum. It almost yeah. feels like the FDA is partnering with you. Yeah. Here's the other part. A new group took over in 1990 regulating psychedelics and marijuana, and they were open to letting research happen. But unless people from the outside submitted applications nothing would happen. And then in 1992 was a big advisory committee meeting where the FDA formalized that they were opening the door to psychedelic research. And that's when we got permission for the first safety study, the phase one safety study. So I have always felt that the FDA was really partnering with us, not because they're pro-drug or pro-psychedelics or pro-MDMA, but because they're pro-science. And it's different than the DEA, which is pro-prohibition, <laughs> or the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which is anti-drug and anti-drug abuse. By design. By design. Yeah. But the FDA was really willing and has consistently demonstrated, and so that we've talked about that with giving breakthrough therapy. That was another example where they did science over politics in a very public way. And I don't think they got any criticism from that. So it does feel like the FDA is partnering with us, but that doesn't mean that they will give us a break when it comes to no, evaluating the data. The data, the data is going to speak. Yeah, it's got, it's got to be about the data. So let's talk about this phase three. The way in which we manage to design phase three and come to agreement with FDA is that they want a minimum of 200 subjects, and it'll be in two 100-subject phase three studies. Because mm -hmm. in a sense, in their mind, it's a little bit more independent confirmation. All right. And there'll be somewhat different numbers of therapy teams and different sites working on each study. But the design is exactly the same. The other thing that has been um, encouraging for us is that the FDA has permitted what's called interim analysis. So statistical significance basically says, is there an effect or not? that's less than 1 20th a chance that it was a chance event. Yeah. And if it's less than 1 20th or 0 0.05, then you say that there's a correlation and a causation. So is there any effect whatsoever is what statistical says? It's binary. It either yeah. says yes or no. Yeah. Effect size is, if there is an effect, how strong is it? How clinically significant is it? The bigger the effect size, the fewer people you need to demonstrate statistical significance. Yeah. So the 200 is based on the data that you've seen in phase two. That feels like the right number, but I assume it could be larger if the effect size is, turns yeah. out to be smaller. So it might be 300. It could go up to 300. Exactly. If it's beyond that, then we feel something's not working. But what the FDA says, too, is that they realize that both effect size and statistical significance are about group averages. But there may be some people who we don't know yet how to figure out but they respond better than others. So the FDA figures that if you get statistical significance, the marketplace will figure it out. Doctors will eventually figure out who are the responders, who are the non-responders. And so they're willing to approve if there's an effect. And then whether insurance will pay for it, whether doctors will prescribe it, depends on the mix of effectiveness and side effect profile. 
So the art of designing phase three was you want to design it that it's large enough to get statistical significance, but not too large because then you're just wasting money. And for us, it's forty or fifty thousand dollars per patient. It'll end up being ten or fifteen thousand dollars for the treatment. We think, yeah, the ultimate yeah. cost. But, but in trial, it's triple that. Yeah. So what I learned a couple of years ago is that the FDA permits what's called interim analysis. So before the study is over, you can have a small group called a data safety monitoring board or a data monitoring committee that takes a look at the unblinded data while the study is in process and then tells me, the sponsor, and I'm the only one that gets this, they'll tell me a number. They'll say, you're fine. You don't need to add anybody or add 20 or 30 people. So they can tell you, mm, looking at stuff you can't look at, we suggest you add 30 people to get the statistical significance where you need it to be. Yeah. They won't say you're treatment effect was lower than you thought, or your placebo effect was higher, or your variability was larger. They'll merely tell you add another 30 people. Yeah. So we have set an agreement in the special protocol assessment that when we have all 100 people enrolled, but we have the data for 60% of them, we will do the interim analysis for the first phase three study. And then if we need to add more people, we will. And if we don't, then we celebrate. And what the FDA has said to us is that they think we can get efficacy for less than the 200 people, but that they want to see the 200 for safety. For the European Medicines Agency, because we'll have so much safety data and efficacy data from the U.S., from the US. we only need 70 people. So how much enrollment have you done now? The last time I looked, we are around 19 out of the first 100. 100. So about 10% of the total that need to go through minimum through the U.S. Yeah. And are they enrolled and already going through therapy or simply enrolled at this point? Enrolled and in the process of going through therapy. They're in the process. So phase three is happening. Yeah. And we think that by the end of 2021 is when we're going to have FDA approval for the prescription use. I saw a video online as I was getting prepared for this interview. I saw a video from 2014. Yeah. And in that video, you predicted approval in 2021, which you have done in every single year <laughs> since then. And you have done everywhere I've seen and you've just done now. And in my world, the tech industry, I doubt if there's been a single instance, <laughs> literally going back to Thomas Watson and IBM in the 1920s of a CEO having a seven-year vision for his or her company and still being on track five years later. And we are currently on track. I would love to accept all that credit for being prescient <laughs> and, and all, but the one area that we were wrong on is the cost. Is the cost. Well, by the way, Thomas Watson and everybody else has been wrong on that too. So you're one for two as opposed to us in the tech industry yeah. invariably being 0 for two. Yeah. So still one for two. All right, we'll now spend two-ish minutes more with Steve Glenn of Plant Prefab. Then I'll be back to tell you about what Rick will be telling us about next week and more. We all know what mobile homes are. You make modular homes. What are they? Modular homes are built with, think of them as big Lego pieces, and they may comprise one or more rooms. They are permanently attached to a foundation. And here are the advantages. A big one is time. Under a traditional site-based construction project, it's a very linear process. When you're doing modular or off-site construction, as you're working on the foundation, grading, foundation utilities, you're working on the modules that comprise them. The modules are being built remotely. Exactly. And the site work is happening at the site simultaneously. Exactly. Right. So that allows you to cheat time big time. The other advantage is cost. When you build in cities, that's your most expensive construction cost, labor standpoint. We're building off-site, and your rates can be much less than the rates in the city. And then waste. The average site-built home, 30 to 40% of your materials end up in landfill versus 8 to 10% in a controlled facility. The design and material choices you make also affect the carbon footprint of the house that's ultimately built. What are some of the more impactful ones? We tend to put LED lights in our homes. They use a tenth of the power of incandescent. We over-insulate. Whatever is being specified, we tend to exceed that. You over-insulate the modules as they're going out. Right. We use an insulation that has among the highest recycle content of any commercially available insulation. We use low-flow water fixtures. We source Forest Stewardship Council certified wood. It's a nonprofit that certifies that the wood is grown and harvested in a sustainable way. Our drywall contains recycled content. 
You're also making window decisions at the module level, correct? Exactly. We're sourcing as energy efficient windows as possible. And that's a big one. Does it have a low E coating that protects against summer sun? Is it dual pane? Is it argon filled? Your approach also saves a fair amount of cost and hassle in the design process too, right? On the design side, you don't have to hire an architect. We've worked with them to create standard designs that you can access and configure online. You can go to plantprefab.com or livinghomes.net, and you can select standard homes from a growing number of architects, some of whom are world-class, like Eve Bahar, and you can configure them like cars with finishes and fixtures and environmental systems you can select. So next week in part two of this interview, Rick and I will be talking about both the future and the past with a little bit of present mixed in. We'll start with the near future with details about this vital phase three study, which is already underway. We'll then talk about the full history of the MDMA molecule, which was first synthesized during the administration of President Taft, who was not a known ecstasy user, I should point out. Then we'll integrate Rick's personal history, which, as I said earlier, is quite fascinating. Then we'll close on Rick's speculative but highly, highly informed thoughts on the near future of psychedelics, both in medical treatment and in society writ large. Now, if you don't want to wait a week to hear part two, the fully integrated two-part interview has already been available to backers of the show on Patreon for a few days now. So if you want to hear the rest of it right now, head on over to patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Rob Reed and Reed is spelled R-E-I-D. There I gratefully and shamelessly accept any donation of any size to support this podcast. And at a level of $5 per month or more, you'll unlock dozens of hours of lovingly crafted special access audio that I've been stockpiling there for generous backers since February of last year. Otherwise, please join us next week. <laughs>